Now we're going to get into the exciting time of GIC. It's right after lunch, you know, everybody's nice and full, settled in. Now the, the interesting speakers come out. <laughs> um, First to speak is going to be uh, Yu Ming Wang. Uh, he is the CIO uh, of uh, C global CIO of Nico Asset Management. Um, he's going to discuss, uh, in a way, where China uh, stands in in uh, in the world markets vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, the U.S. Um, afterwards, Tariq Ramirez, he is the CIO of Sura Mexico. Uh, we'll discuss uh, Mexico and uh, the outlook for, for that country. Um, and it comes at a very interesting time, uh, especially after the election of uh, President Trump. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing both sides. Um, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have some engagement from the from the crowd uh, after both their presentations. Yu Ming. Thank you, Alex. So, uh, first of all, welcome to Singapore for, for those of you from outside of the region. Uh, I'm going to begin this panel uh, focus on investment in the region with a talk on trade. And the reason for that is uh, You've come to a region that trade is fundamental to the whole GDP of the region. If you look at Singapore, annual trade is over 120% of the GDP. So trade is more than the total GDP itself. Korea, that ratio is about 50-60%. China, even though China's domestic consumption has increased a lot, Export is still 20-25% of the total GDP. While on the U.S. side, the number is more like 10%. So you can see how important trade is for this region. So I would like to talk, begin with trade because uh, uh, from this region, everybody is very worried about protectionism, all of the trade anti-globalization that is very much on the media headlines since uh, uh, the new administration um, took, took power. So I would like to begin with maybe a different look at understanding why is the U.S. talking up more protectionists. So let's first just look at the very simple number straight out of WTO's website. Well, first of all, you can see over time that the U.S. trade influence has been decreasing while China has been on the rise. From an export standpoint, China has overtaken U.S. actually many years ago. As an importer, even there, where U.S. has been and continued to be the biggest importer of merchandise goods around the globe, if you take out NAFTA, China is actually closing in to where U.S. ex NAFTA as an importing nation is. So in effect, that protectionist is a continuation of U.S. decreasing or diminishing role in the global trade. From a service standpoint, it's even more stark where you, uh, China has rival where U.S. as an importer of services. So all taken together, you can see U.S. waning difference in global trade versus China. Now, it's even more stark when you focus on Asia itself. So um, I think it was mentioned, uh, Alex, in previous panel where it used to be that when United States sneezes, this region catch a flu. Well, now it's more like if China sneezes, then the whole contagion in this region is bigger than the United States. Because if you take all of the regional uh, uh, largest uh, um, GDPs, the percentage of trade from an import standpoint to ch China is almost two times where that influence from the U.S. is. And that influence is particularly big in North Asia, Korea, Taiwan in particular, then Singapore, and then it goes down from there. 
The second largest trading partner for this region is actually EU, and then US comes third. So that protectionist view is a continuation of in an influence of uh, uh, or diminishing influence that the U.S. has in global trade by looking to cha change the ground rules, for example, the whole TPP discussion, or now protectionism, you can see why it's connected because of that influence is diminishing on the global stage. But are these numbers really telling the whole story? Now I'd like to take your uh, a thought process in a whole different direction that these number that I just shared with you actually is giving you the wrong picture. Why? This is iPhone 7. This is who makes money from iPhone 7. You can see right off the top, Apple takes 40% profit right off the top. Followed by Korea, other US vendors, Japan, Taiwan is big, China, which tends to be the last invoicing party because of the assembly, and China probably has all of that 200 billion or, or however big number of iPhone in that trade number. I, China only takes one to four percent. One percent for the assembly and two, three percent for the part. So basically, what I'm telling you is all those trade numbers that I just shared with you, throw that in the garbage. Because the value chain is not shown in the trade numbers. US is actually doing still very well, even though that the, the trade influence on global stage is diminishing. Because what matters is the value chain. US is making hand over fist in terms of iPhone and other higher value add products. So from a trade standpoint, it's actually not bad. U.S. is still the king. The problem is more U.S. has a di distributional problem. That money that I, uh, Apple makes, 40%, is probably all concentrated in Silicon Valley. That's why San Francisco's real estate is doing very well. Well, Ohio and Wisconsin and other states that elected for Trump probably did not benefit so much. So U.S. trade problem is a distributional problem. As far as the goal of a global trade is concerned, U.S. is doing very well. China is not doing very well. China for invoicing that big number in terms of trade only takes home four or five percent. Now, does China understand this? Uh, uh, um, embarrassing situation? Of course China does. Understand this very well. The value is in the intellectual property. That's why I would say in the next five to ten years, don't underestimate how China is going to be coming up against U.S. in terms of changing that pie chart that I just showed you. China wants to be where that profit is, the goal of the tr global trade. That's why if you look at patents, China is already exceeding where U.S. is in terms of innovation. Second is R&D spending. China as a country total R&D as a percentage of GDP has exceeded where EU is and is catching up to where the U.S. is. Another interesting data is in terms of the latest artificial intelligence and deep learning, there has been more research and citation referencing China than U.S. is. And that is what the China current administration is talking about, China 2025, is to change the value add equation so that they come out on top in terms of semiconductors, in terms of healthcare, in terms of where the goal of global trade is. It's not about the, the raw number itself. So I will leave my opening remark with this slide. Number one, we as an investor in this region, we don't look at the big numbers of the trade or the GDP. It's about people. People drives what Dr. Mester talked about, productivity and real economic structural growth. Especially that middle income that is driving where consumption is. There are forecasts, 
done where they project in the next 10 years, Asia's total middle, middle class could be five to 10 times where US is. Do you expect to have the biggest brands of that middle class consumption value chain to come from US or from this region? I think that is pretty self-explanatory. Number two is, it's not just raw population itself, it's the value chain from intellectual property, innovation, education. That's what value is created. And we feel that today's talk about trade war, what the tariff is and all that, obviously it grabs headline. The real focus we are paying attention to is who's controlling that intellectual property in the whole value of iPhone, for example, or the next technology breakthrough in autonomous driving, in, in, in robotics. Those things would dictate how that value pie chart that I just mentioned, who sits on the top. Is it gonna be US if innovation continue, or is it China with its national industrial policy. So I will pause there and pass on to Tari. Thank you very much. While we wait uh, for Tariq's presentation to go up, uh, those are very th thought-provoking uh, comments, uh, and I hope that we can engage with the uh, the crowd a little bit later. Uh, and I certainly already have some questions that I'll wait to, to ask you after Tariq speaks. Thank you, Alex. Um, I mean, basically here, um, I, I want to give you a different perspective on, on what Yu Ming just said uh, in, in terms of, of the Asian countries. Um, in particularly talking about uh, Mexico and talking about Mexico and as an investment case uh, considering the current situation with uh, with Mr. Trump uh, election and um, and how he's treating trade particularly with with Mexico no? so uh, I mean I, I will start in a nutshell to to give you uh, what, what I think are three main characteristics of of why uh, Mexico uh, has a pretty appealing uh, investment case. First of all, um, it, it has solid macroeconomics. It has been uh, probably two decades since um, uh, Mexico has, has been stable, uh, stably growing uh, without any political turmoil. Uh, since the tequila crisis, uh, Mexico has sh shown uh, very solid fundamentals. You know? Uh, another uh, main characteristic is, is the very ambitious reform agenda that uh, the current administration placed in when, when it got to, to office. Um, uh, I, I don't know, probably some of you might remember Times Magazine uh, f cover four years ago that that's, uh, talked about this, talking about the Mexican moment. No? Uh, Mexican moment talked about uh, the, the reforms, uh, particularly in the energy sector, financial and, and tax reforms that all of those basically are, are um, putting Mexico in a, in a very attractive uh, growth agenda. No? So in, in some years, probably we, we will start to see the benefits out of this. And, and finally, which is, is not the least, um, uh, I consider Mexico to be in a very uh, appealing and particular moment in terms of, of uh, uh, globalization and uh, being a, a, a globalization powerhouse as it is. It's, um, Mexico has uh, treaty, treaties, commercial treaties with uh, most of, of the developed world and, and is considered one of the most open economies in the world. So I consider this to be a, a pretty big advantage. So uh, wh why is Mexico um, currently in, in the spotlight? So as we all know, uh, Mr. Trump has put Mexico in the agenda uh, as one of the reasons that uh, the job has been lost in America uh, for the middle class. No? So, I mean, th this chart shows a little bit of, of how the trade is divided among America. Uh, as you Ming mentioned, um, China is a, is a main uh, partner for, for the U.S. 
but it's, it's closely followed by Canada and Mexico. And uh, for some reason, that is, um, it would be interesting to ask Mr. Trump, but he, he considers uh, the, the being in a deficit, in a commercial deficit, as a bad thing. So he has made it uh, as a big effort to, to say that th that deficit uh, has to disappear. So just to put it in perspective, Mexico has uh, a $60 billion deficit, and which compared to China, it's uh, one-fifth of that. No? So, I mean, it's interesting also to, to see that, um, uh, that probably it's easier for, for President Trump to, to bully out Mexico than to bully out uh, uh, China, no? considering the size of, of the partner. Um, but honestly, we, I, I believe that, uh, that this deficit um, is not, not as bad as it seems. No? Um, globali I, I will argue that globalization has helped productivity grow in, in America. Uh, and probably the, one of the main reasons productivity has grown uh, that much in America to, uh, together with te technology. So uh, uh, I think this commercial relationship has been uh, mutually beneficial. Uh, throughout the years, in the last two decades, that uh, NAFTA has been has been in place. Um, so, um, obviously, um, trade is very important um, uh, for Mexico with the U.S. And as as the chart can show, uh, this almost 73 percent of the trade uh, that Mexico has globally is with the, the U.S. So. Um, what's important here to notice is, is that even uh, if protectionism starts to grow out in, in the U.S., uh, we believe that the installed base and the commer deep commercial uh, ties among the two countries will, will continue to prevail. Um, it's, it's not uh, as, as easy as it seems to basically shut the borders down. Um, we, we believe that, that those commercial ties uh, are there to stay, and um, it will be very difficult, even with an increase in tariffs, to, to slow down the, this particular trend. Um, the, the main issue here, and, and what we consider to be uh, the potential hit that Mexico is, is taking right now, is, is the uncertainty uh, among uh, trade rules. No? So, um, Mr. Trump has been very vocal in, in the way that he has approached uh, the relationship with, with Mexico. But the, the fact, and, and it has been mentioned before here, is that he has not done too much so far. No? He has uh, put NAFTA in the table, uh, uh, renegotiation, uh, it sounds like, a, like the way to go, but up to now it, it has, he has uh, done nothing. But uh, definitely the uncertainty is, is not good for Mexico and for uh, particularly for uh, foreign investment. No? So as of now, uh, we have seen a decrease in interest to invest in Mexico just because um, there are no rules set up on how it's going to be in the future. No? So that, that, I think, is the main issue here. Um, some, uh, some particular um, uh, interesting data, I think, is, is just to look at the components of of what uh, Mexico imports, uh, sorry, Mexico exports to, to the U.S., no? Um, what would happen if um, the political agenda goes through and uh, new tariffs are, are input to, to Mexico's, Mexico's trade with the U.S.? So what we believe would happen is, is that the consumer in the U.S. would suffer the most. Um, particularly through through an increase on, in prices. Um, uh, Mexico has uh, participation in, in a lot of, of products that go from refrigerators to cars to car parts to avocados, uh, guacamole, and, and a, a lot of things that uh, are deeply entitled into the consumer in, in the U.S. And we believe that it's almost impossible for the U.S. to, to start producing all of, those, um, all of those products, as Mr. Trump has, has suggested. Um, and, and why is this that uh, 
what, why is that we think that Mexico uh, will continue to prevail? Uh, hopefully, uh, the chart is not that small to, for you to look at it, but uh, one main reason that we believe uh, Mexico will prevail is that um, <coughs> labor costs in, in Mexico are are on parallel and in terms of competitiveness. Um, basically, um, in that chart you can see the compensation cost in manufacturing, uh, and only uh, the only country that can compete with Mexico could be Turkey. But the, it's probably uh, the, it's 15 percent uh, the hourly cost in manufacturing uh, labor, 15 percent of what it is uh, in the U.S. So even if uh, tariffs increase and, and there is a significant shock in terms of, of trade among uh, the two countries, it's almost impossible to think that those ties will be blocked because uh, an increase in price would have to be uh, of almost four times uh, to to actually be competing in terms of labor costs. So I think th this is very very interesting to see uh, and also if compared to China I mean China has historically been a, a powerhouse in terms of, of cheap labor cost but recently th that trend has changed um, and and if you see in the in the chart below uh, there is a, a 40 percent uh, difference between labor cost in in China for those to Mexico. So, uh, to put it in, in another perspective, uh, w um, the the Chinese government would need almost a 60 percent evaluation to start competing in terms of labor with Mexico. No? So, th this is I think the reason why we think um, Mexico will prevail even if if. Uh, protectionism uh, continues to be in the agenda for Mr. Trump. So, um, well, just to, as a final remarks, um, as I mentioned, we, we believe that the main, um, the main hurt part in the whole protectionism agenda for uh, the current administration in the U.S. would be uh, the consumer in the U.S., particularly through inflation. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, there uh, we believe that there's a uh, few parallel uh, competitiveness uh, to the Mexican labor costs uh, throughout uh, the world. So th this is a, a main competitive advantage for our country. Um, what we definitely think as as the main uh, issue that has uh, that, that Mr. Trump has brought to to our economy is the uncertainty on the rules that's going to be prevail, prevailing uh, forward. So uh, I think once we see we start to see a little bit more clearness on on what his agenda and what his politics are going to uh, look like for the following years, I think um, this shows as a as a good opportunity for the Mexican market and um, and finally uh, we believe that the most probable probable uh, outcome for NAFTA will be uh, a win-win situation in which uh, the rene renegotiation shows up to be a more dynamic and um, and, and more powerful tre treaty that that is the one currently has because the, we have to remember that this treaty was ne negotiated 20 years ago. Uh, both markets are very different now, um, particularly with the reforms. I mean, something that's it's interesting to see. But NAFTA doesn't uh, touch uh, energy market now, so um, the the current uh, reforms have opened uh, the energy market to foreign investment. So I think uh, a potential place to benefit in both uh, countries would be in the energy sector and, and definitely I think uh, a win-win situation for both countries would be the outcome. So um, with that I'll be happy to open the discussion uh, among, among us and, and obviously with you guys. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, that uh, gives me hope. Uh, so uh, it, it's good uh, that you know Mexico is seeing uh, 
again, you know, we think about uh, President Trump, about what he's doing, and uh, we always think uh, negative, uh, but it could be that renegotiating the NAFTA is uh, it's, a, it's a positive outcome. Um, I'm going to start the, uh, the Q&A uh, shortly, uh, but I do have a couple of questions, um, and uh, you know, we'll open up uh, for discussions for the two of you. Um, the, the, the first one is the, the middle income uh, uh, growth that is occurring in both Asia uh, and in uh, uh, Latin America. Uh, the, the, in the demographics. Uh, it's something that I touched on uh, earlier in my presentation, but I, I think it's important to reflect uh, how important that is in the future because that's the future of that internal consumption that everybody talks to in China, everybody talks to in, in, in Mexico and uh, in, in uh, the uh, other countries in LATAM. So if, if you could both address a little bit uh, that topic, that would be great. Sure. I think <clears throat> the growth of uh, middle income class in Asia is for everyone to see. It's being dramatic. And uh, But if, if we step back and look at uh, how that came about, I actually want to tie it to uh, one of the discussion from a morning uh, panel about the growth of debt globally. There's so much debt being piled on globally. But what we have to make distinction is what was the debt incurred to do? I would argue that in Asia, that debt was incurred to build capex, to build factories, bridges, highway, railroads. It's to br build something productive for the future. While as opposed to many developed market, the debt was incurred as pure assumption, uh, consumption. Consumption, when you borrow and you spend the credit card, it's gone, but you have to pay it back. And I think that investment in the last, you know, a, a couple of decades is increasing productivity, is increasing the, the future prospect for economic growth. And that's the fundamental reason why uh, uh, middle class has been able to come out uh, ahead because the nation is wealthier. And I think it's the same situation in Latin, uh, Latin America, where it's that emerging market growth because of investment. Now, what I, my, my answer to your question. Yeah, I guess uh, in, in in terms of Latin America, uh, I mean, uh, I think we are a little bit uh, a step behind what's happened in, in Asia, but still, I mean, it's very promising. I, I think uh, I'm, I'll talk about Mexico in particular, but the, the, the reforms I just mentioned um, are starting to give access to, to credit to people that didn't have it before. No? So I think that that's very promising uh, to people that, that didn't uh, had availability to, to buy a house, for example, are now uh, giving that access. Or, I mean, uh, obviously uh, what you mean mentioned in terms of, of consumer credit is, is not as promising, but th that's uh, what's happening there is that the internal market is growing. So I guess that, that's also a very promising sign in terms of, of where that middle class uh, could be and how, it, how it's, it has been growing recently. No? So um, the formal labor, for example, in Mexico has, has grown dramatically. No? It, it used to be that labor, uh, informal labor, represented more than 60% of, of labor uh, in the country. So now it has gone down to probably 40 or 30%. It's still, I mean, not what it should be, but it's still uh, very, very interesting to see those trends. And as I mentioned, uh, it, it's a, a, a very promising circle in which uh, if that middle class has access to credit, has access to, to a mortgage or, or, or uh, those kind of benefits, uh, the, they will have access to a, a, a higher net worth that could uh, potentially be shown in, in a growing economy uh, further down the road. Great. Thank you for that. Um, just, uh, is there a question on that topic about middle income class, uh, the growth, the demographics? Uh, if not, uh, I'm going to kind of take it in a little different direction here. Uh, okay. Um, 
Another thing I think that in the US and in Europe, and again, uh, being more the developed markets, uh, in the, you know, we take for granted is corporate governance. Um, I think that uh, it, it is uh, an issue that, uh, as as we we've seen uh, in not only in China but uh, Japan and uh, also in Asia, and, and the same for Latin America, people are starting to really clamp down on that, and making sure that that corporate governance is an important factor. Uh, and uh, I would like for the two of you to expand a little bit on that because uh, it, from the first time I heard uh, about it, uh, it, it, it's one of those things that it's, it's embedded in us, especially in the US, uh, that, that is so important. But, but I think uh, for, for these markets that we're talking about, it's, it's something new that um, could unleash a lot of value to companies. Um, in, in, in these two markets. Yeah, I'll uh, come at that governance from two, two angles. Uh, uh, one is uh, governance and the whole uh, topic, you know, uh, uh, what I label ESG, environmental, you know, sustainable investing, responsible investing, has been uh, uh, getting a lot of attention in the region. I mean, starting with Japan, uh, uh, the largest pension in Japan, government pension in Japan has become a, a uh, uh, signatory of the whole uh, responsible investment charter. Uh, China is very interested in uh, how to reform the sector, and obviously is by you know evolution, not revolution. So it's slowly taking much more uh, attention of how to reform the market to be healthier and more robust corporate governance. But I would say that general perception globally that developed market is strong on a governance standpoint and therefore the label of emerging market equal poor governance is deeply poorly misplaced. Why do I say that? Let's just take executive compensation in the developed market. It's corporate governance. It's shareholders money. I think it's out of control in the developed market. But because the shareholders are so decentralized, who is speaking up on that to make a change? Change is very slow. And especially with the passive investors who really, what I call tourist type mentality of investors, corporate go governance in that respect is really not that well, well run. Huh? Uh, in Asia, particularly emerging Asia, the problem is that you have two components. One is the state sector, which obviously, especially in China, when you invest with state-owned enterprises, you're basically you know, in bed with the government. You're not sure if your uh, the money is being worked for the government's policy or is your you know uh, uh, corporate shareholder interest. So that you have to uh, pay attention. Where, where we like investing is actually in a uh, um, situation where there's a dominant shareholder, where a lot of investors actually are not comfortable investing because when you have a family, you know, a uh, uh, very dominant, which is quite often in uh, in Asia is the case. Uh, the founder made the wealth, and they still remain a very controlling part of the family business. And uh, from a classic governance study, that may not, may not be a good sign. But we actually think that if the family's wealth is all in the company, that actually is not so bad when you have great alignment of interest. So I think governance is a very important topic. I don't. I think a lot often it gets oversimplified. That certain thing automatically is good governance is a very complicated subject and that's actually a subject that we take very seriously many good companies we would overrule because of uh, we don't feel comfortable from a governance standpoint but what perceive is get perceived as a poor governance in our view may be a great uh, situation where there's great alignment of interest yeah, I mean, in terms of Latin America, uh, I think that there has been a switch um, on what's perceived as the value of, of corporate governance. Um, historically, um, 
our region has been characterized of, of a family-owned type of business, uh, grown through probably concessions of the government. No, that, that's, that's probably the perception of the largest companies in, in our region. Uh, I think uh, that, that perception has changed. Um, and, and I would agree with you, Ming, in terms of, of dividing uh, this among um, companies that have, uh, have to do with the government and, and the ones who don't. No? The ones who don't, I think, uh, can capture the value of, of a true uh, corporate governance and alignment of interest with the shareholders. Um, as I mentioned, it has transitioned for, from a family-owned type of business uh, culture to a more uh, entrepreneur or private equity type of, of in, uh, companies. And you can see that um, throughout uh, the region, uh, and uh, I mean Mexico included. Um, but what, what's definitely still there, and, and we see that as an issue, but also as a potential uh, as a potential benefit, is is that um, uh, companies that have historically have been linked to the government and or and are still uh, linked to the government, um, they. they are definitely per, uh, per, perceived as, as corrupt uh, in some ways. No? Uh, our governments have, I mean, I, I don't want to generalize because uh, governments among Latin America are very, very diverse. In this case, I will talk about Mexico, no? but the Mexican government has, uh, I mean, still has a very big uh, corruption problem. And any company that has ties uh, with with the Mexican government uh, will be perceived the same way. No? So um, culturally speaking, I think that uh, uh, this is starting to change, uh, but still, we are still not there. And, and that's a potential uh, area of, of growth uh, that our countries, in, well, Mexico in particular, uh, could have in the near future. But um, I think, uh, I mean, the way it's perceived right now by, by outside investors is that uh, any link with the government would imply some, some type of corruption. So um, that type of government is, is, is still not there. But uh, I, I would say that uh, hopefully we're headed to the right path and, and start to change that culture towards a, a true uh, corporate governance uh, that, that doesn't include that type of corruption. Thank you for that. Um, yes. Diego. Diego. For Mr. Diego. Uh, it was. Thank you, Julia. Um, I was very impressed with the slide uh, you shared with us about uh, the trend of the uh, of the patents in China and the intellectuality uh, compared with the U.S. As this is one of the most important value-added uh, components in the future. Do you know? at least or more or less the trends in big data because big data and in intellectuality are going to be two great values for the next 20 25 years yeah i'll touch on just surface because i know just a little bit to be dangerous uh, 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 big data and the whole uh, uh, technology advanced technology for uh, analyzing uh, uh, such trend is really taking hold in China. Uh, uh, we know because there are stock picks that we follow where, you know, it's interesting because you look at the Chinese society, you know, it's almost like they don't have any infrastructure and they leapfrog generations, right? So there's no landline phone, so they go straight into mobile phone. There's no credit rating uh, uh, service. So to issue credit card, you don't know who is better than others. So in fact, uh, 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 big data is enabling that. That's uh, an enabling credit granting agencies as well as uh, uh, life insurance or, or uh, insurance policy underwriter, uh, a better way to assess risk. From, because internet has taken such a strong hold, uh, it's already the largest internet market. So all that data is actually enabling some new entrepreneurial for, firm to be a better risk manager given big data. I'm just treating big data very, very generically. 
So, so uh, uh, that whole chart I show in terms of the deep learning and AI, I was shocked when I saw that. Th that actually came out in a, uh, a, a paper, research paper that is published by Obama's uh, White House, you know, Science and Technology Council, and it's them who actually discovered that China is leapfrogging us. United States in terms of these cutting edge technology. I would not be surprised that is companies such as banks, such as insurance company, using these things to be make better uh, uh, risk management decision. Uh, um, still very much infancy, but in terms of the investment from the private sector, uh, uh, the internet companies to the government, uh, I think it's very serious, very, very, very big. Yeah. Bill? Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Tariq, a question for you. Can you tell us how you view the peso? How much of the peso's move is truly coming from Washington, D.C. versus other more fundamental factors? And as you look at the opportunity to invest in Mexico, is it more on the equity side, more on the credit side, more on the rate side? Where, where would you think the, the best opportunity is? Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, the, the currency in, in Mexico is, uh, as you, as you, I'm sure you know, it's, it's uh, uh, very interesting and, and I would say difficult matter to, to treat because uh, the peso uh, stopped um, moving by fundamentals a while ago. Um, the, the truth is, is that probably today the, the Mexican peso might be one of the cheapest currencies in the world, no? But that, that doesn't um, mean that it's going to appreciate because, uh, as you probably also know, uh, the peso is it's been used as as the hedge for emerging markets globally because it's a uh, one of the most liquid uh, currencies in the world and is deeply tied to movements in, in emerging markets so um, the way we see it is, is that I mean uh, up to recently uh, with the movements and interest rates uh, it was it was cheap to hedge um, and we we tried to suggest any uh, global uh, investor to, to try to hedge the, the Mexican peso uh, risk throughout the use of, of futures or whatever. But uh, but now that interest rates uh, started to move and, and against that that particular feature, um, I think it's, it's one risk that the global investor is still to, to understand because uh, I don't think as I mentioned, that, that the peso moves at fu uh, in fundamentals at all, no? and and um, it's very hard to understand uh, and to invest in a country where where that's the case, where fundamentals are, are not actually moving the the currency. No, mm -hmm. um, for us, uh, in terms of of Sura and, and the investments that we make, um, I think it's, it's just an embedded risk uh, that, that we have to recognize and 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 just um, I mean n not longer think about it too much no uh, I, I know it's, n it's not that helpful of uh, my answer but uh, I, I think um, that is a potential um, a potential investment opportunity yes um, as I mentioned today if you measure it by PPP uh, the peso looks really really cheap but uh, I mean tomorrow mr. Trump could put a tweet uh, that could probably move uh, three four five percent the peso in one day and and that will I mean we will have to live with it uh, and and the markets are, are starting to realize that and, and just think about investing in Mexico as uh, as obviously the fundamentals plus an embedded risk uh, regarding the currency and in terms of, of where uh, we see the opportunities, I mean, I particularly think that uh, current uh, rates in, in Mexico are very attractive. Uh, if uh, even if you hedge out the the, the peso risk, uh, I mean, probably uh, we we are yielding uh, something around four to five percent in a in a note that it's uh, I don't know five years, which is I think really appealing for any investor base considering the fundamentals of, of the country. Mm. Um, equity, for me, seems a little bit expensive. Um, and, and this is funny, no? Because um, 
I mean, sorry if I, I go into too much detail, but the, the index itself in Mexico is very much consumer-based. Uh, uh, it, it's very, very balanced into the brewers or, or the, 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 the beverage um, companies as well as retail. And, and the consumer sectors in Mexico right now are, are trading at, at multiples that we believe are very, uh, very expensive. But that being said, I mean, companies that are out of index, uh, and, and probably the issue here is, is liquidity, no? but companies that have, um, that are out of index seem very appealing. Um, and, and we discussed this um, earlier, but I, I think it's where the growth is coming from from companies that, that are mid-cap probably, um, mid to small cap, but are exposed to, to the best sectors uh, on the economy and the growing sectors. So, um, I mean, I, I believe that there's a significant opportunity in off-index um, companies, uh, particularly in Mexico. Yeah, that's a uh, very good point that, uh, in those markets that you know where, where people want to access for example mexico they want to do it through the index and, and they don't realize that they're actually not getting what they should be getting i mean i know there's a lot of cases like that uh f from from where we sit and and what we try to do from the from the afina side is is looking at that local knowledge local expertise that is uh, it might not be apparent because if you just somebody says, "Well, I want to access Mexico," you know, I'll just I'll just buy the index or I'll just buy uh, the, the the ETF. Um, we believe that there's a lot of value that is added by an asset manager that has local representation, that local expertise, um, and uh, and I know it's not just in in terms of figuring out which companies uh, you know to, to to buy, either it be in the mid cap or or small cap, uh, and figuring out the liquidity issues, um, but also. Uh, talk about uh, if the two of you could talk about it a little bit about uh, the, the political risk um, and the other one is you know government regulation um, that uh, that can uh, by knowing that on the local basis actually can guide you on how you invest uh, for for clients uh, so you know uh, you mean you want to start sure uh, the whole active passive debate is something we are uh, we're very in, involved with because we are uh, an active shop so if I talk about active in favor of active I will be a little self-serving so I will stay out for, uh, of that topic but instead I'll talk about index approach to investing in regions and countries and how that is I think doing a uh, uh, global investor a huge disservice uh, if, if you look at global uh, uh, investor because you know every, uh, uh, everyone loves to have measure so therefore we have indices to help you measure and there are rules how these me uh, indices are constructed so let's just take you know MSCI as an example it's a most uh, widely uh, used uh, uh, index and it, it's good for measuring you know performance but because of the rules that is often market cap based and uh, 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 much more favored developed market because the market are just more developed, as the name you know suggests. Um, today, anyone that is following global MSCI would have about ten, uh, less than ten percent invested in Asia x Japan. Out of that, China would be one or two percent. It completely go against all of the thing I just talked about that the middle class in the next five to ten year could be outdoing US by a factor of five times so therefore you are investing in companies that is very much capturing the growth of the past and have nothing to do with the growth of the future now someone would argue and I had this debate with a, a, a uh, an American investor before where you know you don't have to go to Asia to invest in Asia most of the 
New York Stock Exchange listed company have operation in Asia. And that's a very good point because, you know, uh, international sales of a U.S. NYSE listed company, international sales is, you know, probably 40, 50 percent of that. You know, Asia is a big component of that. So if you are investing in uh, Fortune 500, well, you're pretty well represented in Asian growth. That would be the best argument I could hear in terms of debating what I just said. But that is the true, that's the case for the last five to 10 years. What you're observing right now is that the multinationals are actually losing out because of whether it is ground rule being changed or because of uh, uh, um, uh, um, focus on the domestic market, the number of brand, the, the brands that is uh, uh, non, uh, let's just take uh, uh, China as an example. iPhone is coming down. I mean, w w when you came to the, uh, the air, you know, airport, Changi air Airport, look at the advertising of the best-selling, you know, brand of a, a, a mobile phone is Huawei. And the features are tremendous. I mean, it's great and it's much cheaper. So, so my point is that who is capturing that Asian middle class consumers will be increasingly regional or local brands, no longer the NYSC listed multinational. So therefore, if you are investing in those MSCI index, you are capturing a diminishing part of what Asia is. I think 10 years from now, that dislocation will be so big that you're really not capturing the region. That, that's what I, I, I think is the disservice of a passive approach to a region where every year so much is going on in terms of changes. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, of political risk and, and regulation, I mean, obviously it's a huge thing in, in our markets, in Latin America, uh, in Mexico for sure. Uh, I mean, I, I honestly believe that uh, local knowledge on on this uh, uh, on regulation and and concessions and and how uh, governments are spending in infrastructure um, that uh, local uh, knowledge adds a lot of value to to the investor in general. No. Um, it's, uh, I mean, I can think of an example, no, but um, the, the housing market in Mexico up to, um, I don't know, five years ago, it was purely horizontal uh, growing. No? The, the companies that uh, were represented in, in the stock exchange only built uh, horizontal uh, development. Uh, th there was a recent uh, change in, in legislation that started to, to allow um, constructions to do uh, vertical. No? And this type of changes in regulation um, uh, were only captured by, by local uh, uh, firms and and were a lot. I know a lot of of international firms that were caught of uh, of surprise there and and lost a lot of money investing in this company that uh, I mean in, in this companies that showed as as, as very good companies, but uh, I mean basically the rules changed. You no, know? and, and and it's kind of of what. Uh, Similar to, to what I mentioned before, that the, if those rules change and if you don't know about it, you probably will get burned. So that uh, uh, local knowledge and and the the ability to capture that that uh, let's say upfront adds a lot of value. So I, I honestly think, particularly in our markets where where those changes are are frequent, um, I think uh, there, there's a significant value there for sure. Great. Do we have any uh, question on 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 that topic? Uh, my next question is uh, is more of a uh, uh, kind of understanding as you know as as you have your CIO hat on and uh, you're given one dollar to invest and you say. Where do we go? And and one question, and, and it goes back to a qu conversation we, we had with uh, Tony outside, is would you go DM, as DM is represented today, or would you go EM? And uh, so that's one, if you had that $1. Um, which one do you think in the next 12 months uh, would be the winner? 
And, um, and the other question is, with that same dollar, and, and I'm going to put the two of you basically to, to talk a little bit about <laughs> why you would get that dollar. Would you invest that dollar in emerging Asia, or would you invest it in, uh, in Mexico? Uh, uh, Alex, I'll answer the question in uh, a couple of different ways because 12 months is hard. Because, you know, for us, uh, uh, 12 months is like a blink of an eye. We, 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 uh, uh, we tend to think very long term, you know, at least five years and sometimes 10 years. I think the wealth uh, uh, in this region is think 10 years from now. And so our uh, uh, focus is actually find those stocks that in the next 10 years are going to grow five to 10 times in terms of their, their, their wealth. Yeah. So you know, uh, uh, find them now and then invest in it. And these tend to be not SOEs, uh, uh, tends to be you know probably mid cap companies uh, that are covered only by a couple analysts, and we will know the company really well. So so that my answer would be you know uh, uh, emerging Asia mid cap and uh, uh, non-index stock that are very uncovered for the next 10 years. For the next 12 months, uh, uh, which I'm going to come out probably, you know, 50-50 uh, 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 in terms of EM and DM, uh, uh, and I will say the DM part uh, as a house, we favor much more uh, uh, Japan, followed by Europe, and U.S. is at the bottom of our, our priority list because we think the valuation is very stretched. But uh, uh, Japan is uh, is riding a, a nice recovery trend. There's a lot of negative demographic trends that everybody know. But I think finally Abenomic is a. Uh, 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 Harvesting is finally some results is showing, and uh, uh, I actually think that uh, Japan is probably the best DM pick. As far as e uh, 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 Asia and uh, uh, Mexico or LATAM, I actually I love LATAM market because I think there's a lot of uh, true reform and true market forces uh, uh, taking shape. I actually think that the whole uh, uh, NAFTA and all of that will come out. Uh, uh, Mexico will be happier for it because short-term pain sometimes could be long-term uh, uh, gain. And so uh, I think it's a great valuation uh, market. And uh, uh, so I, I look at LATAM and uh, Emerging Asia as equally attractive part of being in the EM basket. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I pretty much agree with uh, most of what Young, uh, Young Min said. Um, in terms of, um, of developed versus emerging, um, I, I kind of uh, favor a little bit developed markets. I would say 60 to 40 percent, uh, only because, and, and I agree entirely, because uh, Japan and and I do also like uh, the Europe region. No, uh, we we are currently underweight the U.S. Uh, versus uh, the two other regions, um, and uh, agreed again in terms of, of the U.S. valuation seems stretched and particularly with with whatever is going to happen in terms of, of political uh, legislation and, and, and movements in terms of Trump, uh, that gives us a, a degree of, of uncertainty that we don't feel comfortable with. Um, going back to, to, to the decision among uh, emerging Asia or uh, Latin America, I think uh, both of them are, are, have their benefits and, and I agree that the, where you where we see the most value is, is just out of index companies and, and that, that's something that that um, that we see among uh, different emerging markets uh, is that uh, global investors uh, basically do the flow to the, those index companies and increase multiples to to certain point that is, is just not attractive anymore. So th that happens both in, in emerging Asia and Latin America. So where we see the value is definitely in, in the mid cap range where where we see uh, the fundamental growth um, actually bringing value to our investors, and and we see that equally among two regions. So uh, I wouldn't say that one looks better than another it's just not not in the big large cap companies uh, i would uh, go down a notch there 
a very diplomatic answer from uh, both panelists. Um, I think, uh, are we, uh, okay, this is uh, one more question, no more questions, so okay, that's it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yuming and Tariq. Uh, thank you. Thank you.